Um, I'll try and come back on most of the points, but there was quite a lot of the, a lot of the discussion. Um, first of all, I think um, you know at the heart of the discussion is um, what is socialism, and that's really kind of why I wanted to write the pamphlet on the shadow of Stalin. Because you know, to be a Marxist, I think you need to do one thing, and that's believe in that the self-emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class. Whether that, you know, forget about reading Capital and all the rest of it, though, of course, I encourage everyone to do that. That's really at the heart of it. Uh, it's about saying liberation is going to come through working class self-activity, uh, trying, uh, trying to overthrow that system, uproot exploitation, uproot oppression, and build a different sort of society from the bottom up. And therefore, I think the theory of state capitalism is actually incredibly important to rescuing that classical Marxist idea of working class self-emancipation. So you have the highs of the Russian Revolution, it's degeneration, and then the grip of Stalinism right across the uh, international socialist and labor movements, not just within the communist parties, which were sizable, but also in social democratic parties, looking towards the Soviet Union as some sort of counterbalance towards, the, towards Western capitalism, towards America during the Cold War. And therefore asserting that these societies weren't socialist and actually weren't an alternative, I think was incredibly, uh, was incredibly important. And also quite theoretically innovative. And that's part of what attracted me to um, socialist worker when I, when I was first getting into uh, Marxist politics, is that you know, we don't just sort of talk about Lenin and Trotsky and Luxembourg to cross ourselves and genuflect. You have to take what, what's good about what they said and try and apply it to the, to the world as it actually is. And if something isn't you know, working, that you don't think it actually applies anymore, then you have to take a cold hard look and say, that's actually a load of bollocks. And that's what Tony Cliff did. He said um, there was a huge debate in Trotskyism after the Second World War, where Trotsky made a series of predictions. Where he said the Soviet Union would uh, not survive the Second World War. Um, he said, Capitalism was going into its death throes, and what happened after the Second World War, the Soviet Union emerges stronger than ever in charge of Eastern Europe, and you see the longest unprecedented boom in capitalist history, rather than uh, capitalism's death throes. And a whole series of Trotskyists said, we are trying to you know, do all these intellectual somersaults, so there's a guy called James Cannon in the US who said, the Second World War hasn't ended because the Soviet Union hasn't collapsed. You know, that was clearly you know, nonsense, but you, know, you try to justify it saying, ah, but Trotsky said everything that Trotsky said was right. And Cliff said, well, actually, we have to take a look at reality. And I think that's, that's important for that reason as well, theory of state capitalism. It's this idea of, 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 of Marxism being you know, this method which we apply to try and change the world and try and understand the world. But it's not just a you know, scripture. And I think that's, that, that's also important uh, against, uh, against Stalinism. Um, a couple of questions about sort of rev uh, revolution and and Stalinism. Um, but when I was talking about the sort of different journeys of Stalinism within the, within the revolution, sorry, I was trying to sum up very quickly. I was, I was trying to refer to the Victor Serge quote. So Victor Serge was an anarchist, originally an anarchist, who went to Russia and then five months in joins the Bolshevik party and then is part of the opposition to Stalin in the 1930s. And he says, he wrote, he, he wrote in his book From Lenin to Stalin, it is often said that the germ of all Stalinism was in Bolshevism at the beginning. Well, I have no objection. Only, Bolshevism only contained many other germs, a mass of other germs, and those who lived through the enthusiasm of the first years of the Victoria, first victorious socialist revolution ought not to forget it. To judge the living man by the death germs which the autopsy reveals in the corpse is that very sensible question mark. In other words, he says, look, yes, perhaps there were many germs in the Russian Revolution, but it wasn't inevitable that Stalinism was going to be the outcome of, uh, outcome of that. And when it comes to the debate about, look, was it premature to go for um, socialist revolution in Russia? I think this is actually a debate that continues today. I remember in the 2000s when I was becoming involved in, in left politics, the, finance, the, the left wing finance minister of Bolivia at the time said, we can't possibly go for socialism. We have to go through 100 to 150 years of Andean capitalism and development, and only then can we hope to, to, get, uh, to get socialism. And in the end, what did Andean capitalism mean? meant? It actually meant going on a lot of fossil fuel companies, extractive industries, uh, and so on. And that same debate was kind of taking place within, within Russia at the time. 
And there was one group which said, look, really we're within Russia, all we can hope to achieve is a kind of bourgeois democratic revolution. Uh, and that's what the working class can push for. Lenin actually had a position of saying that the working class has to kind of lead the revolution because the nascent capitalist class is so cowardly, but that too would have to be a, uh, a, a democratic revolution. Actually, Trotsky argued for well, this idea of permanent revolution. And this comes through what he called uneven and combined development. In other words, yes, Russia was economically backward, However, it also saw some of the most advanced centers of capitalist development as well, in Petrograd uh, in particular. Uh, there's this great picture actually from um, Huzovska, which was a town in Ukraine, uh, set up by a Welsh engineer. And you've got these, you know, really, and you, there's a picture of, you know, you've got the latest technology being dragged on kind of sledge and horseback. This idea of uneven and combined development, you know, the most advanced bits of capitalism along some, alongside some of those backward bits. And Trotsky says, well, this meant that the working class, while small numerically, had a social weight within that society disproportionate to its size, because those centers of capital accumulation were incredibly important to the Tsarist regime, and therefore it had the potential to actually go much further than just a democratic revolution. And talk about going uh, and, and talk about going towards a so, a social revolution. However, that would be an alliance with uh, with the peasantry, and then in order to win and break through, the revolution would have to spread so that material level could be paced within uh, within Russia as well. And part of the way that the Ru Russian revolution actually degenerates is that these two processes, workers' revolution in the cities and the revolt of the peasantry, begin begin to start to. Um, Start to uh, come and stuck. You know, the goals of those two were kind of in tandem at the time, but the working class was much more fighting for a social transformation, the peasantry much more for breaking up the landowning estates and so on. If the revolution had spread and you were able to sort of, you know, bring in the latest technology, try and raise the material level, you could have sought to try and win over the peasantry to a more kind of socialistic goal. And that was that was the idea. However, that didn't happen because you had the isolation, you had the essentially the societal collapse that came off the back of the of the civil war. So these two processes start to come unstuck. That alliance between the peasantry and the countryside and the, and the working class in the urban areas uh, uh, begins to um, begins to um, unravel. And therefore, in that context, you know, the Bolshevik face and show us. Um, do we try and hang on in the hope that revolution spreads and keep the door open for the possibility of revolution or not? And within that, within that context, um, all sorts of decisions were made and we don't you know, justify all the sort of things that Trotsky said dur uh, during that period. Um, I do think that Trotsky and the left opposition and the program they put forward about we need to industrialize but with workers' control and seek to spread the revolution offered the best chance of trying to save the situation from where it had, uh, where it had got to. But you know, this is dire, you know, this is dire straits that the, uh, the, 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 the Bolsheviks and the, and the country are, um, are in. Um, the, this, just, I'm probably going to be able to sum up. So just the last thing I want to say is, you know, I think you know, sometimes these things can sound abstract, but I think they're actually quite important in terms of the debates that we're having about how do you change society uh, change society today. And part of the reason I think that you've seen a bit of a growth of Stalinism on the left, or people looking to that, is you've seen the collapse of quite big left reformist projects in recent years, Corbynism, uh, Bernie Sanders in the United States. And you know those are forms of socialism from above, is what they were promising. And I think some people have flipped from one form of socialism from above to another form of socialism from above, which can seem a bit more militant. Now, because, you know, say what you want about Stalin, he probably could have dealt with the Blairites in a more effective manner. <laughs> so I think some people have sort of said, ah, that's kind of more militant and more effective what the Soviets did than what the Labour left did, who are generally quite talentless. But anyway, so uh, I think that's what you're seeing. And I think we have to try and put an argument to say the real alternative is working class revolution, working class self-emancipation, uh, working class self-emancipation from below. Thanks so much.